Well, thanks very much for the invitation to speak at this meeting. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and talk about something that will become very interested in, and that is environmental factors and motor neuron disease. So ALS or MND was recognized as a medical condition almost 150 years ago by the French neurologist Charcot. So 150 years later, we've worked out that 10% of MND cases are familial, and around 30 mutations in 10 genes have been identified. 98% of MND cases are sporadic, and the causes are unknown. So 150 years later, environmental risk factors are still largely a mystery. So why? Why do we know so little about them? Well, it's complicated. A huge number of factors could be involved. So when you're looking at genes, you're looking at a finite number of genes. When you're looking at environmental factors, you're looking at pretty much an infinite amount of uh, possible possibilities. So, fascinating talk earlier on, endogenous viruses. Smoking, stress, mobile phones, air pollution, electromagnetic fields, algal blooms, heavy metals have all been, been implicated. And in many cases, there is some evidence supporting them. Another problem is there could be a critical time of exposure. A lot of animal studies are showing that certain toxins, if you get exposed to them when your central nervous system is developing, so when you're very young, that is the most uh, critical time. It's also possible that you need exposure to multiple factors. So this makes it very hard to study. It's also not treated as a research priority. So this is one of the big meetings on ALS MND. It's in December and it's in Dublin. Fortunate enough to be going to that meeting there. And um, I had a look through the program. So the program was released, the abstract booklet was released, and I thought, I wonder what's going on in environmental factors in MND. I was looking through the booklet, I could hardly find anything. And I was finding that's quite depressing. And then when I had a look at the statement on the website by one of the organizers, they were saying cutting edge research aimed at identifying, describing ALS MND genes and gene networks. So maybe I've got the wrong picture of. MND. It's all about genes and gene networks. So I just find that slightly depressing that environmental factors is not really getting more attention. Okay, so how can we identify these risk factors? Well, what you can do is compare the instance of MND in two populations. So for example, as Carol said, you can take males, you can take females, work out the instance of MND in these populations, and overall it's 60-40 male to female. So these observational studies are done on specific environmental factors. They tend to be small, they often show trends, and can be a bit inconclusive, sometimes even contradictory. But what you can do is pull them all together. So you can perform a meta-analysis by combining the data from many of these smaller studies, and then you can generate something that is more powerful and more believable. So this was something that came out last week, I think, so it was basically a um, paper in neurotoxicology. And what they did was they did a meta-analysis on a lot of these environmental factors. And it was pretty interesting data. So how do you do that? Well, for example, heavy metals. Compare the instance of MND in individuals with an occupational history of exposure to heavy metals. You compare that to the general population and work out if it's, there's evidence that it's a risk. So this is what it looks like. All you really need to think about is anything on this side favors risk factor, anything on this side favors controls. So any of these points, if they're on this side, it would be protective. So here we've got um, exposure to lead. The first thing is not that many studies. First one in 70, probably every 10 years someone has a look at it. This one is exposure to heavy metals in general. And what you can see is every one of these studies show that heavy metals or lead in this case, and heavy metals here, increase your risk of developing MND. So just one more of these um, is, um, what about if you live in the country? Is that a risk factor for MND? Well, it isn't actually, but if you're exposed to agricultural chemicals, if you're working in farming or something, it possibly is. So for example, here we have people who were exposed to pesticides. On this one, sorry, exposed to pesticides here, and you can see, again, all the data is lying on the, the risk. Agricultural chemicals, it's all lying on the side of risk. So we can say 
pretty conclusively that the risk is increased if you're exposed to pesticides and agricultural chemicals. But we have a problem because not everyone who was exposed to these chemicals, even pretty powerful ones like the organophosphate pesticides, developed MND. Increased the risk, but not everyone developed MND. Another bit of sporting data here is that people that worked in a pesticide factory, they were threefold more likely to die from MND than the general population. And if we combine that with one last piece of data, which showed that ALS patients in Italy had more mutations in this PON1 gene. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is that organophosphate pesticides get detoxified in the body. And that involves this um, PON1. And different people, were, we're all really genetically different. And different people have different levels of this enzyme. So some people might have um, mutations in this enzyme and the enzyme isn't very active. So maybe this is how we get this interaction between genetic susceptibility and risk factors. In this case, the risk factor is exposure to organophosphate pesticides. The, um, risk fact, the um, susceptibility is genetic mutation in PON1. So now we've got another model of environmental <coughs> factors and MND. It's multifactorial. Environmental factors plus genetic factors. The thing is, these guys are modifiable. You don't have to spray organophosphates on your plants. These ones are unmodifiable. So there are some of these, most of these studies, they're actually like questionnaire studies. Where you, did you work here? Were you exposed to this? But what you can actually do is some of these things hang around for long enough that you can actually measure them in the blood. So these are called persistent environmental pollutants or PEPs. And a study is now underway um, with Gio Giemann at uh, Macquarie and Dominic Rowe, at which we're going to measure levels of these PEPs in blood samples from MND M &M patients and controls. And this is used in the Macquarie Biobank. So this study is currently underway. The samples are just about to be sent to France to this massive toxicology lab, and they're going to screen them for lots of that stuff. Um, in the meantime, there's a study published a couple of weeks ago um, and they showed that in Michigan, which has got a lot of these things floating around, there was a correlation between levels of these um, PEPs in the blood and MND. So, Gilles also found out the types of um, insecticides, miticides, herbicides and fungicides that are being sprayed in our crops. These are the best-selling chemicals in New South Wales. We're exposed to a lot of weird stuff. If you look up the chemistry of these toxins, it's pretty scary. It's pretty scary how little is known about them. And I was also read that in America, sometimes it's hard to find people without some of these in their blood. It's like just everyone's got them. Okay, so moving on to something else that has attracted a lot of attention recently, and that is cyanobacteria and MND. So this all is about the island of Guam. So I'm going to give you a quick picture story of what happened in Guam. Portuguese explorer sailing around the world, gets to Guam, lands there, hangs out with the locals for a while, goes home. It becomes, it was Portuguese, it becomes Spanish, and the Americans like it because it's got a good strategic position in the world. So the Americans take it over, and what do they do? Build a naval base there. So when the American physicians visit Guam, they report something really strange. A high instance of ALS PDC, which is a mixture of motor neuron disease, <coughs> Parkinson's, and dementia. And it was, it was a hundredfold the instance of anywhere in the world. So this, they got really interested in this. The reason they got really interested in it, it wasn't you know, confined to the Chamorros, the local people of Guam, because um, Filipinos, uh, Japanese married into the Chamorro families and they also had the higher risk of this disease. So everyone thought, fantastic, we've got a chance of working out an environmental factor. And there was a woman called Marjorie Whitting did a lot of work in this and she worked out it could be something to do with these cycads. They had cycad forests over the island, the people made flour from the inside of these cycad seeds they ate fruit bats, believe it or not, and the fruit bats fed on these cycad seeds. To cut a long story short, there was a chemical in there called BMAA, 
which was bioconcentrated in the fruit bats. It was in the flower they made tortillas from, so the people got quite a high dose of it. It actually wasn't made by the, the tree. It was made by cyanobacteria that lived in the roots. So cyanobacteria in the roots of these plants releasing this chemical BMA, and people were ingesting lots of it. So what is the evidence that BMA causes disease? There's lots of animal studies. I'll just mention two primate studies. One was recently with the vervets, and the other one was macaque monkeys. Um, the macaque monkeys were actually fed the BMA by gavage. So they tripped down the throat, giving them BMA. And I know one of the guys that worked in the study in 1987, and I said, oh, did you anesthetize the macaques? And he goes, no, the guy that used to work with them was a big burly guy, and he used to just hold them. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know if it's true or not, but it's a, it's a pretty good effort. So it's not, it's mice are nothing, you know. <laughs> people, are, people are doing that with monkeys. Yeah. But the other one, the recent one that Paul Cox did, he actually put the BMA in bananas and uh, fed it to the, the, the monkeys that way. Anyway, so both of these um, primate studies, behavioral or histological changes consistent with neurodegeneration. The Cox one is pretty interesting because it looked a little bit like Alzheimer's and it looked like MND as well. The other bits of evidence are hotspots, hotspots of um, MND around specific regions. A lot of work in the uh, USA around about lakes with algal blooms in New Hampshire, and some in France linked to consumption of mussels. Mussels, filter feeders, they just filter all these things out of the water. Um, the other bit of evidence is mechanisms identified. The weird thing about the Guam disease, people went from Guam to America, developed the disease 20 years later on average. So there was something was ticking away that wasn't manifest. So that's why we're interested in this protein misfolding and ER stress. There's a group in Germany also done it. Excitotoxicity, metal binding. So lots of possible mechanisms. So I just want to talk about something else we're doing is we're trying to monitor the environment in New South Wales for BMAA. And I'm just going to give you a quick bit of chemistry because it's pretty fascinating. After two days of sample preparation, you end up with a whole load of small molecules that have derivatized or tagged. You put them on this column, some of them just zip through the column really quickly in the solvent, some of them interact with the column and get slowed down. So you can separate all these molecules. They then come into the mass spec. The mass spec can actually select a specific molecular weight. So this will only examine as chemicals of this molecular weight. They then go into this fragmentation cell where it blows them apart and you get fragments. So that you can actually ID all of these molecules. So these molecules are really, really similar. The isomers, same molecular weight, same atoms arranged in a different way, but got different fingerprints. So what we've been doing is analyzing sand bacterial samples from around Australia. And we can see they all contain BMA. They all contain, or three out of four contain DAB and a couple of them contain AG. And these peaks you see here are when they come off that column in different times and you can do the ID on all the fragments. What, we, what I also did, I had a family holiday in Central Australia, I found a few cycad seeds, so I brought them back to Sydney, gave it to one of my students and said, check them out for BMA. This was the biggest BMA peak we've ever seen in any sample. So cycad seeds in Guam, same as cycad seeds in Central Australia, um, contain BMA. So what we're doing now is we're monitoring water in New South Wales, and a guy called Lee Bowling has been collecting these for me. He gave me a ring and said, I'm, I'm downstairs in the car park, I've got some samples for you. Bring down a trolley. So I brought down a trolley. His book was full of samples. There's, I don't know how many, I haven't even counted them. But basically he's been monitoring them in lakes around New South Wales for two years. So um, we've got a big job to do um, analyzing these, but I think this would be the most comprehensive analysis of BME anywhere in the world. Considering when we started this, there was only one sample that had ever been analyzed. We've got carp. They concentrate the BMA in the carp brain, so we can analyze carp brain. We can analyze these little fish called the mosquito fish or um, parousia, so we can monitor the Australian environment. Something else we noticed is that BMA and DAB produced by sand bacteria always occur together. This is a nuisance because it's quite hard to tell them apart. So we're thinking, well, what if these other guys are also toxic, what's going to happen? So what we did is a, a study, a proteomic study. You take some human neuroblastoma cells, you feed them BMEA, or you feed them BMEA plus DAB, 
and you have a look at what's happening. And what we're doing here is a really, really low dose to see. We don't want to kill the cells, we just want to see how they react. And what you do is, with proteomics, you can actually analyze 5,000 proteins in the cell on one hit. And you can work out which ones are upregulated up and downregulated. So up, down regulated. So BMA alone, a little bit happening, but not much. BMA plus DAB, really, really massive change. And when you analyze what these proteins actually do in the cell, you find, whoa, change the fuel, <laughs> sorry. I think there's a bit of a, a, bit of a um, Mac PC problem, but never mind. The bottom line is, this was pretty scary because so many of these pathways are really already linked to ALS. So oxidative phosphorylation mitochondrial dysfunction linked to ALS, MND. DNA, oh, sorry, DNA damage, um, RNA dysfunction, apoptosis, apoptosis autophagy, ubiquitination, um, protein synthesis, all linked to ALS already. And another one, this one here, EF2 signaling, was actually something that came out of the vervet study that was done a couple of years ago. Okay, so where are we with environmental factors and MND? So, Al Shalabi has been doing some really good work on this. And this is where we're at, in, in my opinion. You've got genetic susceptibility, you've got age, and you've got multiple environmental factors. So, they all contribute to the risk and increase the burden of disease-causing factors that can precipitate disease once a threshold level is reached. So, essentially, you get hit with these environmental factors up to a certain point, and that's the threshold point. Al Shalabi did some other modeling studies, which were really, really fascinating, and worked out you need six hits. So he did this on five separate registers, and he got exactly the same data, and when he modeled it, it was linear, so it means it's multifactorial, and when you look at the slope, it told you there were six factors. So that's pretty much where we're at with um, MND and environmental factors, as far as I can see. So the take-home message from me is an understanding of the environmental contribution to MND is essential, since it's the only easeable, modifiable component of the overall risk. So I'd like to thank uh, Cure for MND Foundation Research Grant for funding this, which is the current year. My students, collaborators at um, Macquarie, all my environmental people, and um, yeah, thanks for, uh, for listening. <laughs>